we're going to talk now about the Psalms. Okay, we're going to talk about the Psalms. And here's why I'm singling the Psalms out. Singling the Psalms out for two reasons. The first is back to that idea of story. So we're talking about the story of stories and our stories and, and how they intersect and uh, what is the value of knowing the one for the sake of the other. And, um, and then equally, what, what are the Psalms doing? I mean, so far, it's been easy to talk about story because we've looked at historical narratives, right? Genesis and First Kings and so forth. And we've talked about the prophets, uh, granted briefly, but you can see how the prophets are responding to the story and how it's gone bad and how we can get things back on track. So what is this collection of poems right there in the middle? So the, the question becomes, well, how do they fit into the story? And I think I've already indicated this. I've said that the, 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 the kings of Israel are responsible for, the kings of Judah, are responsible for leading Israel in worship and then dispensing the Lord's wisdom to the people, right? So it should come as no surprise that the author who, to whom most of the Psalms are attributed is David. David, the first great king of Israel, that first paradigmatic king. And then the Psalm, I'm sorry, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, are written by Solomon. So there you have the worship literature and the wisdom literature of Israel. And the kings are, through their writing at least, leading Israel in worship and displaying wisdom through these books. And so that's why they sit right in the middle of our, our chiasm that we talked about earlier. But equally, the Psalms themselves tell the whole story. So here's the second reason why we're singling out the Psalms. For the longest time, I've been uh, intrigued by the way whole books work together. So we saw that with Genesis, probably in more detail than any other book today, that for all the individual stories you have in Genesis, there, there's a singular point. It's all coming together to get us from Genesis 3.15 to Judah. Right? That was my argument. Everything in between is the drama that gets us there. But then I asked myself, well, if you can do that with, with every book, I mean, Isaiah has a, for all, for the length of Isaiah, there is a singular message. You can summarize it in one sentence, right? Um, well, what about the Psalms? The Psalms are 150 individual poems, songs, that don't seem to have anything to do with each other. You got, you got one situation here and then another situation there. What's the connection? How do we get from Psalm 1 to Psalm 150? And for the longest time, I just thought, well, that, just don't ask that question about the Psalms because they're a collection of 150 Psalms. They could have been organized some other way, but there you go. Somebody gave them a bunch of numbers, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, and only we go to 150, right? But then I noticed something, and I, I'm sure you've noticed this as well. If you look at Psalm 1, look at Psalm 1, and uh, you'll notice that at the top of Psalm 1, what does it say? In big, bold, probably bold print or all caps, Book one. Book one, right. So turn to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. And right before Psalm 42, it says, Book two. Book two. And then Psalm 73. You know what you're going to find. Book three, right. And then in front of Psalm uh, 90, book four. And then before Psalm 107, book five. So, hmm, there is some organization here. Somebody, whoever put the Psalms together in this order, it may have been the priest Ezra. We don't know. That's as good a guess as any. Even though these Psalms are written by different authors in response to different circumstances, David's on the run from his son in this one. Moses is reflecting on the Exodus on that one. Still someone else named El Nathan is thinking about X, Y, and Z. And they've written these Psalms in responses to all kinds of situations in the life of Israel and in their own individual lives. But somebody put them together and called them book one, two, three, four, and five. And so it's, it's that flow of the Psalms and what is the Psalm, what, what is the Psalter? So all 150 Psalms together we call the Psalter, P-S-A-L-T-E-R, the Psalter. What is the Psalter doing? 
So if Genesis is coming together with individual stories for a, a point, is the Psalter doing the same? And I really wrestled with this because I had no answer to it. I, I thought, well, is the first one sort of about one attribute of God, and book two is about another attribute of God, and book three is still another. And when I thought I discovered an attribute of God, lo and behold, I found that same attribute in spades somewhere else as well. You know, so it's like, that wasn't working for me. And then, uh, two years ago, was it two years ago? About a year and a half ago, we had a professor at ITS, his name was Dionade Tomfu. Dionade, Dionade Tomfu. And he, um, uh, currently he's serving a church and leading a seminary in Cameroon. But while he was here, he taught a class on the Psalms. Uh, and I dropped in and he opened my eyes to some pretty significant things. And I'm thrilled. It just made a lot of things click for me. And I'm glad to share them today. So go ahead and turn back to Psalm 1. Go back to Psalm 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to discern the flow of the Psalms and the point of the Psalter. And what we're going to see, I'll just uh, put the thesis out there right now, is that Old Testament meta narrative that we just got done looking at this morning is retold in poetry form in the shape of the Psalter. Not in every single psalm. You can't track it exactly all along the way. But there are certain key moments in the Psalter that show the shape of that larger story. And what are those key moments? Those key moments are called the seam psalms. Seam psalms. At your church, you should sing seam psalms. What does that mean? A seam, like the way clothing, two pieces are stitched together at the seam. That kind of seam. So the seam psalms are the psalms that begin and end each of these books. So five books. How does book one begin and end? How does book two begin and end? Book three begin and end? And so forth. And what you'll see are these pillars in the Psalter on which everything else is draped. Seam psalms or pillar psalms. I guess I'm mixing metaphors here. But the psalms mix metaphors all the time. So next time someone critiques you for mixing metaphors, say the psalms do it. Okay? So we're going to look at the seam psalms. And in each book of the psalms, uh, I've given a name to it that I think sort of captures the ethos of those psalms, okay? So let's start with book one. Book one. And those names are printed on your handout there. Let's go ahead and look at book one. Book one is the near-death tribulations of David. What page is it on, Christy? 14, page 14. The near-death tribulations of David, who emerges from the grave to rule the nations. I think when you take... Uh, again, under the influence of Tom Fu, I'm convinced of this, and it's from my own further study, but largely coming from him. Uh, when you take the Psalms, all, the first 41, as a whole, while there's all kinds of diversity in there, and not everything fits exactly into this, into this, this you're going to jam every square peg into this round hole, but nonetheless, the shape of the whole of book one gives you this, that David nearly dies many times. And in fact, he thinks he's going to die. So you think of Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's not just beautiful poetry and a profound metaphor for a troublesome time. I feel like I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death right now. No, no, he thinks he's going to die. He thinks he is about to die. And there are many other episodes like that. And if you think back to David's life, yeah, that was quite common, right? Saul is chasing him. His son is chasing him, right? Absalom. Goliath is chasing him, okay? Uh, and all these kinds of things. Uh, the wolf and the bear, you know, he did battle with them too. Uh, the lion and the bear. So David, but, but when he doesn't die, he comes out to rule the nations. He rules the nations. A great example of this is Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is powerful because that's the one where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus, of course, quotes that on the cross. But then halfway through, and, and, and his enemies are all around, and they're dividing his garments. And you don't divide garments unless the person's dead. And in that culture, well, you took what you could from, from your enemies when they died, right? So taking his clothes. Uh, but then halfway through the psalm, it suddenly switches to uh, David ruling the nations and the others coming and bowing down to him. So somehow he's gone from the grave to ruling the nations. 
Uh, and so let's look at some of the details here that capture some of this. And again, it'll be the seam psalms that give color commentary to things like Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 that I just mentioned in that capacity. So we'll start, verse, we'll start in Psalm 1. Um, would one of you like to uh, stand up and read in a nice loud voice Psalm 1? You look like you're ready. Go for it. Amen. Thank you. Uh, very intentional that this is the first psalm for several reasons. There is no superscript. There is no ascribed author at the top. It just starts, blessed is the man. And it really serves as a bit of a table of contents for the rest of the book of the psalm, the rest of the Psalter. Right. Uh, these metaphors of the, the or not the metaphor yet, but the, the wicked and the righteous, the law of the Lord. Uh, and then the metaphors of nature, trees and streams uh, and so forth. And then the, then the concept of judgment right there at the end. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, but, but they will perish. Uh, but the way of the righteous will be saved. So those are constant themes throughout the Psalms. The righteous who's in trouble and he's saved. Those who are wicked and pursuing him, and he's judged. Uh, nature metaphors and so forth. So it really serves as a nice table of contents. But it raises this question. Your translation said, blessed is the one. Many of your translations will have said, blessed is the man, right? Blessed is the man. Who is the man? What man? What man is blessed? You ever think about that? I'm sure you've read Psalm 1 probably many times. Is there a specific man in view here? I think it's the Messiah. Someone said David. Someone said Jesus. The seed of the woman? These are great answers. They're all right, by the way. The question is, how do we pull it together? Any other options? Any other options? Let's start with the more obvious option before I even raise the question. Yeah, it's you, right? It's you. It's, it's any man, woman, or child who reads the Psalms and worships God, who meditates on not just the Torah, blessed is the man who medit delight, delight in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night, but but by being the beginning of the Psalter, it's in, in the Psalms. Meditate on the books of Moses and meditate on this, these Psalms. These Psalms will help you lead you in reading the Torah, reading the books of Moses uh, worshipfully. Right? Don't just read it, but read it like this in the Psalms. And so it's anybody who meditates on the law and who, who read on. Right? Take this table of contents and read through the Psalms and meditate on them day and night. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's absolutely right. That's what's great about the Bible sometimes. It hits you on these multiple levels. And so the other level then is David, Messiah, Jesus, seed of the woman. Any other options? What if we paid attention to some particular details? Notice that this man is blessed. He's given the law. He's to meditate on it day and night. He's like a tree, streams of water. Sound like anything familiar? Where else is there a man who is blessed with trees and rivers Adam. in the context of day and night? Adam. Adam. And then there's tons of Genesis language here to make you think this is Adam. Day and night. There's even the wind that's blowing here. Uh, the, the trees and the streams. Okay, this is, this is Adam. Which means, back to the first answer, this is every Adam and every Eve. Right? Who will live this way. But remember, Adam is a cosmic figure. He's, he's not just a stereotypical, prototypical uh, person from the primordial past to say, well, where did we all come from? We all came from Adam and Eve. Uh, rather, he is in the Garden of Eden. He is at rest with his creator. When he's meditating on the law day and night, one would assume that also means obeying the law day and night, he is at rest. And so this first psalm is a picture of Thriving, 
flourishing humanity as it ought to be and as it was. Now, why throw a psalm out there like that? Is this just pie in the sky, wishful thinking? Oh, man, if only Adam. Hmm, we could be that way, too, if it weren't for Adam. Or is it leaning forward to say Adam was promised, Eve was promised a seed who will restore that kind of thing? This will be the experience of the new creation. New streams, new trees, new law. It is, after all, after the judgment of the wicked. And so Psalm 1 is not just an invitation to the Psalter and a worthwhile reflection. Hey, I want to be that kind of person who meditates on the law day and night. I do want to have my be successful and prosper and, and these kinds of things. But an invitation to reflect on this larger cosmic level, the beginning of the story... And how we might get back there. How it might end. Through a new man. The seed of the woman. Who we know, we'll see in a moment, is Jesus. But Psalm 2 is, is like the second half of the table of contents. So let's take a look at Psalm 2 as well. Um, another volunteer. Maybe someone from this side of the room to read Psalm 2. Thank you very much. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together, against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. Thank you very much. So... You got this Psalm 1 situation in the Garden of Eden, and it's beautiful, and it's reflective of the past, and hopeful of the future, but then Psalm 2 quickly gets down to, gets down to business. It was like, okay, that's how Adam was, and that's how humanity should be, but what is it really? The nations are raging. Verse 1, why do the nations rage, and the peoples plot in vain? What are they plotting? What are they planning? The kings are there, set themselves together, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, against the new man, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. Psalm 2 is saying, here's the general disposition of the nations. We don't want Yahweh to rule over us. We don't want his son David or anybody else, Judah, remember that's about Judah, or David, or whoever else it might be, or Solomon, to rule over us. We're going to burst off their bonds. They're holding us back. Right? And that's what Christianity is about. It's about God holding us back. We don't want any of that. That's what people say. Right? So the Lord's response is to wring his hands and to fret. No, no, my creation. No. Verse 4. He who sits in heaven laughs. Holds them in derision. Speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Okay? This rebellion effort is not going to get very far. What's his answer? Verse 8, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That is the Lord's answer to the raging and rebellion of the nations. I will take my king and I will put, them, put him on Zion, that's, Mount, that's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, to rule over them. He will bring order out of this chaos. He will bring submission and faith and worship out of this Rebellion and uh, uh, a treason of creation and so forth. And so in verse 7, then, the Messiah, the king, responds. If Yahweh is speaking in verse 6, the Messiah responds in verse 7. I'll tell the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Remember that phrase from 2 Samuel 7? You are my son. That means you are the Davidic king forever to rule Israel and to rule the nations and build the temple. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. Those nations that rage, I originally created to be, in, to be in worshipful response to me in the Garden of Eden, and now they're raging, I give them to you. They're yours now to deal with, which we know is to bring them back into submission in the Garden of Eden. But first, 
Verse 9, you shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, because he is responding in wrath. So the king is to bring justice against the unjust and rebellious peoples of the earth. And so verse 10 now zips back down to heaven. We kind of had this dialogue in heaven there between the Father and the Son. Now we zip back down to earth in verse 10. Therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son. You see, he doesn't have to smash you like a rod of iron. That doesn't have to happen. You can submit. Today is a day of amnesty for all the raging peoples of the earth. Submit to the Son. Kiss the Son. Lest he be angry and you perish in your way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Someone once said, there is no refuge from the judgment of the Son, but refuge in the Son. There's no refuge from the Son, but in the Son. And so if you nations would repent and turn, then you would be ruled by King David because the nations are his heritage to the ends of the earth. And so this is sort of the the charter, the table of contents, like I said, of the book of Psalms. This original creational idea to which we will return with the new man, but then the current situation and God's solution. Give them the Messiah. So so, so, uh, Psalm 3 then begins with this first superscript. Verse 0, as it were, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So like, whoa, we got, we got this original creation ideal in the future, the reign of King David, and now he's on the run. It's like, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, much of the rest of book one is about David's struggles. The path word, the pathway, in other words, up to Mount Zion, to the place where he will finally take possession of the nations, it's a very difficult path for this, this son. It's not just, boop, you're the king, all good. Rather, the, the son, the man, the seed, will have some difficulties along the way. And so, as I mentioned, book one is full of David on the run. Most of them are written by David on the run, near-death experiences, um, and so on and so forth, till we get to chapter, uh, sorry, Psalm 41. Turn now to Psalm 41. And we're looking now at the very last book. Forty one, beginning in verse nine. Beginning in verse nine. Now again, this is important to know. This is the last psalm of the book. That started with creation, Adam, son of God, son of David, uh, 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 subjection of the nations and redemption of them if they will repent, ends, goes through all these trials and ends with this one. Even my close friend, verse 9, verse 9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Everybody's against him. Everybody's against him. Son is against him, Absalom, right? Enemies, true enemies are against him. Even his family, even his close friend is against the man, is against the anointed one. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. This is the confidence of David at the end of all, at the end of all things. This is what he knows. The enemy, the one with enmity, will not win the victory, despite what it looks like at any given moment. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. And you should hear in that, I hope you hear in that, echoes of 2 Samuel 7. The temple of the Lord is the presence of the Lord and it's promised to the son of David forever. So again, the word forever is not just dropped in everywhere because, oh, it's a religious book. And that's what we talk about. We talk about eternity. This comment on the presence of the Lord forever is where the Messiah will end up despite having to go through almost death. Or you can get the picture. And then the book ends with, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And then every book of the Psalms ends with something like that. 
Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Every book ends like that, with a little blessing of the Lord right there at the end. But the last comment before that benediction is, you set me in your presence forever. Forever. So book two, then, turns the page. If book one is about the Messiah rising up through his near-death experiences to rule the nations and to bring them also into God's presence forever, book two, then, that has started. That has begun. So I call book two the rule of the house of David forever. The rule of the house of David forever. And so I've got this little drawing here. You also have it on your, uh, in your um, packet. That book one starts and then climbs up. And book two is like a little pinnacle. It's, it's about the reign of David and uh, what uh, the creation will look like if the son of David can accomplish what God says in 2 Samuel 7. So look at Psalm 42, verse 3. Psalm 42, verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night. So you hear that echo of Psalm 1, right? Day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? So Psalm 2 begins with more of the mockery of the trials in book 1. Where is your God? Turn to Psalm, uh, turn to verse 10. Verse 10. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? And this is the question then that book two will seek to ask. If it's true that the son of David's rule and reign restores creation and brings us back to the Garden of Eden, the nations are saying, well, let's see it. Let's see what it looks like. What does that kind of society, what kind of humanity does that look like when the son of David is on the throne and people are kissing the son? You follow me? So turn to Psalm 73 now. I'm sorry, 72, 72. This is where we're going to camp here for a little bit because Psalm 72 is the answer to that question. What's the question again? Where is your God? Question people are asking today. Right? Show us, show us the evidence. Show us the evidence of your God. Right? Well, that's what we're challenging David with. So if that's the question, the answer is, when the son of David executes wisdom and justice and righteousness amongst his people and leads them in worship, that will be the evidence of who God is and what he's doing in the creation. And so Psalm 72 is the pinnacle of that. And Psalm 72 is really the pinnacle of the whole Psalter up to this point. It's the last book, I'm sorry, last Psalm in book two before we start to go downward. (laughs) Okay? So here's what I want to look at in Psalm 72. You ready? Verse zero. Verse zero. When you read the Psalms, you should pay attention to what's called the superscript. The superscript is not the, uh, every Bible does it differently, it's not the italicized words or boldface words where sometimes you get some kind of generic title give the king your justice or something like that. But rather, it's the all caps where it says of Solomon. Do you see that? Uh, does anybody else have something different at the beginning of Psalm 72? Of Solomon? A psalm of Solomon. A psalm of Solomon. So that gives the impression that Solomon wrote it, right? Anybody have something different? No one? All the translations in the world? <laughs> There are three ways to what it, what it says in the Hebrew text. There are three ways uh, to translate it. Of Solomon is one, but that's actually less common. That's less common than to Solomon. Yeah, doesn't that make a difference? These are not words said by Solomon, but actually to Solomon. Or it could be translated for Solomon. Now, I think it's two or four Solomon, and here's why. Look at the very end. Look at verse 20. Psalm 72, 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So what's going on here? Is this a psalm by, of Solomon? But then you say at the end, that ends David's prayers. Or, it's more likely that that should be rendered to Solomon or for Solomon, and that this is David's prayer for Solomon, the first son of David 
in the line of the seed of the woman to redeem humanity and restore the presence of God to the creation. And so this is the last thing David wants to say to him or maybe even pray to God for him. So what we're about to read is David's hope for the Davidic kingdom. Now, in saying this is the the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended, if you keep reading in the Psalms, there are more Psalms by David. So what's going on here? So the point is not that this is the last Psalm of David in the Psalms, but that this is the crescendo of all the other Psalms. The end in terms of the telos, the goal, the final horizon. What was my life about? Why did God call me from being a shepherd to be the king of Israel? So that I could give Israel and I could give the world this kind of son. Who will do what? Well, we should look. Give. So now we begin with verse 1. This is why I think it's a prayer. Because give the king your justice, O God. So it's a prayer. So he's not talking to Solomon. But he's talking about Solomon. Give the king your justice and your righteousness to the royal son. That is the main point of the psalm. Everything else is details. David's prayer for his son on the way out is not secure borders or economic prosperity or fame or fortune. What is it? That he will be known as a king who has justice, verse 1, and righteousness, also verse 1. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Why do you think the poor are singled out? I mean, doesn't everybody need justice? Yes, everybody needs justice. But the poor are singled out for this reason. It's often the poor that can't get justice for themselves. If you, if you are socially, culturally, or economically empowered, you probably know the right people or you have the right resources and funds to, to stick up for yourself. But it's the poor who can't give, who can't find help, who need somebody, who need a shepherd to take care of them. And David is praying for his son Solomon That he won't bow down to the lobbyists who have tons of money, but bow down and reach down and lift up those who don't. This will be a demonstration. Where is your God? Our God is in our king. Because look at how he treats people. And look at what happens to the society when that happens. Um, Jump down to verse uh, 8. No, 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 no. Uh, we'll, go, we'll come back to verse 8 later. Uh, go to verse 18. 18, 18. I think that's the one I want. No, it's 16. It's 16. Sorry. Okay. Verse 16. May there be an abundance of grain in the land... So not like, not like uh, Ruth that started with a famine, right? And on the tops of the mountains may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon, Lebanon. And may the people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May the people blossom. Do people blossom? No, flowers blossom, right? But what a beautiful metaphor. We all know what it looks like when a, when a flower is in bloom. We also know what it looks like when a flower is wilted. May the people look like blossoming, blooming flowers. Right? If you will live this way, if you will be righteous, if you will be just, the poor will be cared for, and everybody will thrive in their person. There will be a blooming of humanity. That's just glorious. Now let's do go to verse 8. Let's do go to verse 8. May he have dominion from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. Now that's interesting because what else did God say to Satan? On your belly you shall go and may you eat the dust all the days of your life. You don't think Genesis 3.15 is in view? It's certainly in view. David is praying that would Solomon be the one who finally crushes the serpent, finally crushes the enemy, not just of Israel, but of all humanity. The kings of Tarshish and the coastlands will render him tribute. Verse 10, now that's people outside of Israel, right? The kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. 
May all the kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Look at verse 15. May he live long. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. So you've got the obedience and the tribute of the nations, the flourishing of the people, the righteous and just care for the poor. If people live this way, you won't need a massive theophany. It's Mount Sinai and all of that kind of glorious evidence of where is your God. You will simply be able to say, look at how the people live. They get their cues from the king in terms of justice and righteousness and they blossom and flourish. In other words, a certain society that treats people a certain way is evidence of the kind of king that's ruling them. And the psalm wraps up like this, verse 18. Now we'll go to verse 18. Bless the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. May, he be glor- May his name be glorious forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth to be together, that the glory of the Lord would fill the earth. And as Adam and Eve continue to obey God's word and subdue and rule the earth, they will spread the glory over the whole earth. But that's not what happens. And so therefore, it requires a new man, a new seed, a son of David, who will come and through his righteous, just rule of the people, the glory of the Lord will again spread over sea and land. And that is why, verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. That is the goal to which the line of David is headed. Does God answer that prayer? Does God answer that prayer for Solomon? Kind of, but kind of not. So we move into book three. We move into book three. And I call book three the decline of the house of David. Psalm 72 is the crescendo, that eschatological, great end times vision of the new creation, the presence of God and the glory of God all over the earth through the king of the son of David. Psalm 73 is going to act like, uh, remember 1 Kings 11? The, that beginning of the downward spiral. The beginning of the downward spiral. So I call book three, the decline of the house of David and the rod of men. Where am I getting that term, rod of men? Remember that? 2 Samuel 7. If your son obeys me, he will be my son. But if he disobeys, I will discipline him with the rod of men. So look at Psalm 73, verse 2. Uh, we'll start in verse 1. Uh, a psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had almost, my steps had almost slipped. Now again, you can read this like Psalm 1, and you would be right to read it that way. Of anybody who, if you read Psalm 73, it's about somebody who envies the arrogant, envies the wicked and the prosperous. And why can't I be like them? They don't have any troubles. They don't have any pains. Uh, and then he remembers, it says... Uh, 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 in verse uh, verse 16 but then I thought and understood this I went into the sanctuary of God and discerned their end truly you have set them in slippery places they are going to slip right so it's a psalm individual lament about how this person has this internal struggle that seems so easy not to follow the Lord and I wish I could just be like these other people who seem to be all, all good, uh, health, wealth, prosperity, or whatever, you know, and I'm struggling here. Um, but equally, by placing at the beginning of, of book three, it's emblematic of Israel itself and the king. The king had almost slipped. In fact, the king does entirely slip. And so book three is this downward spiral until you get to the next seam psalm, Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is the end of book three. So book one begins with this vision of Eden and the Son of God who will restore the obedience of the nations, goes through trials and ends with David's arrival at the throne and this optimism that his kingdom will bring a just society, climaxing perhaps in Solomon. But Solomon and the kings slip, they slip, 
And they end up here now in, in Psalm 89. The first 18 verses of Psalm 89. Uh, more than the first 18 verses. More like the first... Um, yeah, 37 verses. The first 37 verses of Psalm 89 are a rehearsal of the great promises God made to David. So we can look at a few of them. We can look at a few of them. Look at verse 19. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted the chosen one from among the people. I have found David. You see that? Verse 23. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. Sounds like Genesis 3.15 again. And then 27, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So there's that idea again that the son of David will rule not just Israel, but all the nations. Verse 28, my steadfast love I will keep for him forever. Verse 29, I will establish his seed forever. Verse 34, I will not violate my covenant or alter the words that went forth from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. Verse 37, like the moon, it shall be established forever as faithful witnesses to the sky. Selah. Now verse 38, but now, you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. Listen to verse 39. You have renounced the covenant with your servant and defiled his crown in the dust. Verse 44. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth and covered him with shame. How long, O oh Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Verse 49, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? What's going on here? This is, of course, the exile. This is the story of uh, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. If you were living in Israel at that time, the time of the exile, this is what you would have said. You would have said, I just can't believe Yahweh has been defeated by the Babylonians. That just doesn't fit. That's, that's not what's going on here. It's not that Yahweh has been defeated by another god, for there are no other gods. What's going on here is Yahweh in his own sovereign will has thrown David aside. God has done this. And it feels like, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. But you've got to put yourself in the situation of Israel. You're being dragged from your home. You're being carted off to a foreign country. You're being forced to eat their food, wear their clothes, speak their language, worship their gods, and thinking, oh, what about those stories we heard from what is now called First Samuel? And what about, what about Genesis? And, what about the plan of redemption? These people are dominating us. We should be saving them. And they won't even listen to our stories about the great God of Israel. Do you understand how that would feel? And so verse 50. Verse 50 is the prayer. Verse 50 is the cry now of this psalm. Remember. Remember, O oh Lord, how your servants are mocked. How I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations. Wait a second, man, we started with the rule of King David over the nations, and then we moved to Solomon blessing all the nations and receiving gold from the nations and the people blossoming like flowers among the nations. And now they all insult us, with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Remember, every, every book ends with that little benediction. Blessed be the Lord. That's the shortest one. It's like, I gotta give a benediction. That's the best I can do. <laughs> right? And that's how it feels. That's how it feels to be in exile. That's how it feels to say, you know what? I got this theology that says God is good. God is covenant keeping and promise keeping. 
but we're in exile. And, and, and the question is, verse 46, how long? How long? And then verse 50, remember. 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 So if book one is about the near-death experiences and the basically... Uh, I'll go ahead and use the word now. The resurrection of the King David to rule the nations. And then book two is the, the sociological argument for the existence and nearness of God through the way we live. Verse, book three is the slipping away thereof and ending in exile. What is book four? Book four is life in exile. What is it like now? I mean, this is the onset of exile. You understand? This is now life in exile. And so we have the first book. And I call this one, I call this book, The Lord God Still Reigns. That's what people of God need to hear. They need to hear, Your God Still Reigns. And you should cry out, Remember, O Lord, remember, because He does. He does. In fact, that's how the Exodus actually began. It says he remembered the children of Israel. And so in exile, you continue to cry out, do for us in exile what you did for them when they were in Egypt. In fact, what is the superscript for Psalm 90? What is the superscript? That's the generic title the editors gave. So it's hard to distinguish between those two. A, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. There's only one psalm written by Moses. Only one psalm. And it's, and it's placed right here. It can, again, it could be placed anywhere. I think this happened after the exile. Ezra has 150 psalms. What do I do with these? I'm going to put them in order. He could put this one anywhere. You, maybe you would think, I would probably think, make this one first. Yeah, it's Moses. He's, he's Moses. And he's probably the oldest. But it's put right here. And why is it put here? Book four? Because Moses brings back memories of the Exodus. We were in Egypt. And the Pharaoh was killing us. Drowning our babies. Right? And enslaving us. Forcing us to worship false gods. And Moses came. The Lord brought Moses and so this is a remembrance of, we're saying remember, O Lord. The Lord's saying to us, well, you remember. You remember. Remember the Exodus. Remember the Exodus. And so look at how Psalm 90 begins with verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You see, we don't live in the land anymore. That's not our dwelling place. The Lord is our dwelling place. Before the mountains were brought forth forever, you have formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. What a perfect way to begin life in exile. To remember that the creator God created everything. And he is your dwelling place no matter where you live or what you're experiencing or how it feels like a frowning providence is over your house. The Lord is your dwelling place. He made the mountains. He formed the earth. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And then verse 3. If that's what you need to remember about the Lord, this is what you need to remember about yourself. You return man to dust. And you say, return, O children of man. Our days are brief. But he is from everlasting to everlasting. That's the first thing. You get some perspective on yourself and on your God. Jump down to verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. You see, understanding the brevity of your own life, that you are, so here comes Ecclesiastes, you are a vapor, you are a breath, here today and gone tomorrow. And listen, if there is no God, if there is no answer to this question right here, then life is vain, life is pointless. I mean, what, all this rambling and wrangling about love, hate, justice, politics, money, death, you know, look, we're all going to die of one way or another, and it will all be as though it had never happened. So that's one way to look at the world. Another way to look at the world is to say, well, hold on, well, let's, 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 put, let's get the creator back in the picture here. 
who is from everlasting to everlasting, and who determines the time and space of your existence. In other words, if you were premeditated, right, and, and the Lord said, uh, you will live here, and you will live now, and you will serve me in these ways, suddenly you're here and you're now, and your ways are full of meaning because a sovereign, intentional God has determined it, rather than blind fate, dumb luck, or whatever. And so this is what we need to remember when we are in exile. And then we need to have that heart of wisdom that, you said it earlier, I think, situates our individual lives in the larger story of God. And then verse 13, remember, O Lord, how long. Where did we hear that? That was at the end of book three. Remember that? Now it's also here at the beginning of book four. But again, go back to verse three. The Lord says, return, O children of man, return to the dust. And then verse 13, return, O Lord. So mankind will return to the dust. But in exile, we cry out, Lord, you return to me. Return to me. And then verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What an interesting way to end the psalm. This psalm is saying, you set your hand to something. You have a job, you raise kids, you have a vacation, a vocation, you have vacation, you have vocation, uh, artwork, you know, whatever you, gardening, whatever you do, it's meaningful. It has purpose because God is from everlasting to everlasting. And our lives, whether they're glorious and fulfilling, you know, check all the boxes of our existential desires, or down here, as Israel's life is now, it's not without purpose. It's not accidental. And even in that context, there's some good that God wants to do through us. And so even though you'll go back to the grave, you'll go back to the dust, in cosmological terms, tomorrow, I say that with a smile on my face, <laughs> nonetheless, your brief days can have meaning. Even down here. Even down here. Because that's where Israel is. Israel's is down there. Now what's great about Psalm 91 is that Psalm 91 is the psalm that Satan quotes to Jesus in the temptation in the wilderness. Uh, where is it? It's in verse 11. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hands that will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. What a great word to people in, in exile. He will bear you up. He will bear you. You are down and out. God will bear you up. It may be a while. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? But he will bear you up. I mean, that's, that's, that's Satan's psalm right there. He won't bear you up. You're down and out. I've, I've got it right here. And you don't. And God doesn't. But here's what's interesting about this psalm that Satan quotes to Jesus. Is he cuts it off in the middle. Look at verse 13. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Now that's ironic. <laughs> Satan quotes right up to the moment where the promise is made to the seed of the woman in their darkest hour, God will bear you up and you will still trample the head of the serpent. It's a great place for Satan to stop reading, but it's a great place for you to keep reading. Amen? Turn to Psalm 106 now. Psalm 106. See, again, what I love about the Psalms is it's taking the history of Israel and it's saying, you can, you can map your own life against the history of Israel. So personal and individual, yet so cosmic and redemptive and corporate. Psalm 106 now. How does Psalm 106 end? Well, Psalm 106 is recounting the Exodus. It's a remembering and a restatement, singing again about the Exodus, exactly what you need because you're in exile, you need to come out of exile, you need a new Exodus, a second Exodus. Then finishes up with verse 47, Save us, O Lord our God, 
and gather us from among the nations, that he may that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. So you can hear it right there. That's the prayer. Gather us from among the nations. We are scattered. We are out and about, far from your presence. Bring us back. Bring us back. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. And that's book four. Now, book five. I call book five. The new Davidide, or Davidic son, will lead the great end times pilgrimage of the peoples in a new creation. So if this is the cry to bring us out of exile, this is what comes out of exile. Again, it's following the trajectories. If this had never happened, what would happen if God finally does answer that psalm of Solomon? That psalm for Solomon. Maybe not in Solomon, but in the next Solomonic king. You get it? This is what will happen. So look at, look at 107, verse 1 through 3. O Lord, give thanks. I'm sorry. O give thanks. Which remember, remember Psalm 106, 47? We will give thanks. So 107 begins with, we give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, for he has redeemed us from our troubles and gathered us in the lands from the east to the west, the north and the south. Well, that was the prayer at the end of Psalm 106. Gather us and we'll give thanks. Oh, give thanks, for he's gathered us. This is the return from exile. This is now the return from exile. Look at Psalm 108. Uh, superscript. A song. A psalm of David. Now, we had said that this was the end of the psalms of David. And there have been a handful, but not many, throughout these sections right here. Tons of Davidic stuff here and here. Very little here. And then it all goes <coughs> storming back here. What do you think the point is? I think the point is, remember those near-death experiences of David? Oh, yeah, he did die. His crown was thrown into dust. The whole line of David died. Now the line of David is back. End of exile will also mean resurrection of the house of David. More than that, look at Psalm 110. Somebody mentioned this earlier. Again, a psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Your enemies under your feet. This is Genesis 3.15. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments. You will have a collection, a community of priestly followers who will gladly serve you, O King David. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, which is everything that was said in, in Psalm 89, but it sure didn't seem like it, but it was true. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now here's why Psalm 110 is so exciting. It's in book 5, and so the end of exile, the great end times new David, who will bring in the nations to finally fulfill things like Psalm 1, will be a king and he'll be a priest. That is, that, is, that is a new idea dropped into book five at the end. Because why does Israel go into exile? Sin. So if we're going to return from exile, we need a sacrifice for sin. We know we need a king, but man, we also need a priest. Woman, we also need a priest. And as I mentioned, this is the psalm that Jesus will use to end all dispute and debate uh, during the last week of his life with those who are questioning who he is. You want to know who I am? Okay, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm Psalm 110. I'm Psalm 110. I will sacrifice myself as an atonement for sins for all God's people, Jew and Gentile, who are called in Christ, and rule the nations. You ever wonder why at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? I think about that. I mean, what would you think if someone came down the street and said, you know what, heaven, earth, belongs to me. 
Everything in heaven and everything on earth happens because I'm in charge. That's what, that's what Matthew 28, 18 is about. All authority in heaven and earth. That's an audacious claim. Why can he claim that? Because he's saying by virtue of his sacrifice, priest, and his resurrection, king, he now rules the nations. He is the Psalm 2 son of David enthroned on Mount Zion to which the nations now come in glad obedience. Of which, I look around this room, y'all are exhibit A through Z. In other words, your ancestors, like my ancestors, worshipped the rocks and the spirits of the rivers and the mountains and feared the thunder because Thor was coming down on them or whatever. You understand? In God's kindness, he opened our eyes and turned us to the true king who subdues the raging nations. Through the Psalm 110, priest king, Jesus Christ. But I get ahead of myself. Let's see how does the fourth book, sorry, fifth book, end. I hope you remember, turn to, turn to Psalm 146. 146. 146. I hope you remember that at the end of each book, we had this exclamation of praise. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord forever, and so forth, right? But the fifth book ends with not just a couple lines of praise, but five psalms in a row that are just full of praise. So Psalm 146, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise him as long as I live. I will sing praise to the God while I have my being. Psalm 47. Praise the Lord, verse 1. Psalm 48. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord in the angels. Praise the Lord all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens. Praise him this. Praise him that. 49. Praise the Lord. Sing praise to the Lord. And then Psalm 50. Praise the Lord. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with string and pipe and with sounding cymbals. Praise him in the loud chambers. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that word breath comes right out of Genesis 2. He breathed the breath of life into humanity. And if we were to read all of Psalm 146 through 50, we would again see the mountains and the trees and the rocks and the rivers also praising God. Again, not being praised, but praising God. In other words, there will be a new creation. When the priest king ends the exile, not just of Israel, but all humanity, and brings us back into the Psalm 1 Garden of Eden, it will be a new creation. It will be resurrection. And it will be, it doesn't say it here, but it will be rest. It will be rest. And creation will reach the telos to which it was always intended. God is not scrapping things. He's saving things. And so, again, as part of the Old Testament, this sits there for a while and creates the hopes and fears of Israel. Hopes that God will come through, fears that he won't. For hundreds of years. Hundreds of years until we get to, well, pause for now. Let me take a few questions. Let me say again, not every psalm fits into these categories, but this is the shape of the Psalter into which the individual psalms can be tweaked, right? Uh, I think are intentionally situated there for, sometimes loosely, but you get the sense that you got David, 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 David. And then here we are back again. So one or two questions, then we'll, then we'll break into our groups again for discussion. And I don't mind that we cut into the fourth hour to continue those discussions, because I, I think they're important. Okay. Uh, so uh, a question, comment. Yeah. Is it a different word in Hebrew when it's like a psalm of Asaph? Or does that have to be No, usually psalm of what meant written by him. Uh, give me the, the specific one. What was that? 40, 42, was it? Is, say that again? 72, okay. No, it's the same word. It is the same word. But it's more than just the word. It's the ethos of the psalm and the fact that it's David's last song, and it's the same song that 
that, that climax of David's reign? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? Yeah, okay, Chris. Well, I'm not sure I can, can you hear it then there, yeah. I, I'm not sure I can um, frame it properly, but I'm kind of having a hard time wrapping my mind around the timing of this, and I have my study Bible in front of me. Are you saying that when Ezra kind of pulled all these together, the Psalms, and used them during the captivity, or were Ezra written, probably written during they weren't yeah some, some were written during the captivity okay. so yeah these were written at all kinds of different moments in Israel's history as far back as Moses yeah. during the life of David even in exile okay. even in exile but when Ezra brings the people back to the land okay. remember he reads the law and he's yep. I mean we're re restarting Israel here and I, I something like this probably goes on in his mind you know we got I mean, what a history. Whew, and here we are. We're back. Uh, we need, uh, we, let's take the songs of our people that we sing and worship and uh, let's put them together. Let's, let's organize here. And I believe the Lord, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sure. led it, uh, uh, Ezra to redact, to edit the, psal the Psalter to be with the final form. Even though individual people, Moses wrote it a long time earlier, had no idea it would be used that way. Okay, yeah. and then so can you, do you, would you happen to know who, like, who wrote um, during the exile was for Asaph? Or, I mean, I don't really know. Yeah, no, I don't know off the top of my work. head. Uh, oh, okay. A good study Bible will tell you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good okay. question. That's a good question. Yeah. Now, that Ezra business is a theory, but somebody did it. Somebody, somebody did it. That yeah. way. Okay. I appreciate chronological Bibles mm. having these Psalms in the context of the very helpful. Was taking place. Yep. The people who wrote it mm -hmm. for that period of time. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's sometimes um, artificial to see the songs all gathered. All gathered together. In one place. Right. I, I don't think that's how it was arranged for a long time. Yeah. Obviously, you're, you're teaching us about that, but. Um, I think that there's just a whole other um, context mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Setting up their, I agree. Their, their calendar it, date and time. Yeah. If I were studying a single psalm by itself, I would look into that. I would look into that. But isn't it interesting that when they are finally put together, there's this arc to them. And to be clear, this is the Psalter Jesus read. This is, this is what Jesus received. And Jesus recognized. So I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. So I agree with Jesus. Right? Yeah. But you're right. As you take each individual psalm. And it says um, when Solomon, when David was on the run from his son Absalom. Go back and read that story. Figure it out. Right? That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Let's take that break. And Aaron will give the further instructions for your groups. Right? Yeah. So here's what I can do.